Thank you for downloading this episode of In Our Time. For more details about In Our Time and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk slash radio4. I hope you enjoy the programme. Hello. In the middle of the 18th century, a group of aristocratic women formed an informal club which met regularly at their homes in London. This group became known as the Blue Stockings, and at their gatherings they discussed intellectual matters with the leading thinkers of the day. At a time when women had little access to formal education, the achievements of the Blue Stockings were considered remarkable. Leading members such as Elizabeth, Elizabeth Montagu and Elizabeth Carter were celebrated for their erudition and their success, and their success led to greater acceptance of women as the intellectual equals of men. But as the 18th century drew to a close, the Blue Stockings started to attract suspicion. Eventually their name even became a pejorative term. With me to discuss the Blue Stockings are Karen O'Brien, Vice Principal and Professor of English at King's College London, Elizabeth Eger, Reader in English Literature, also of King's College London, and Nicole Pohl, Reader in English Literature at the Oxford Brookes University. So Karen O'Brien, can you give us some idea of what, where the word Blue Stockings came from in the first place and what they were? Yes, certainly. The Blue Stockings were, as you said, a circle of brilliant, clever women, scholars, literary critics, novelists and educational writers who flourished in the second half of the 18th century and who coalesced around the homes of three London society hostesses, Elizabeth Montagu, Elizabeth Vesey and Frances Boscowin. Uh, and the social gatherings of these women provided remarkable opportunities for cultural and literary exchange. They were informal and yet serious, uh, and they, were, they famously excluded uh, the fashionable pursuits such as card playing and uh, drinking alcohol, that the drinks were tea and lemonade and people were encouraged to mix in an informal way. And part of that informality was that some of the male members came along in their blue woolen stockings instead of their more formal white silk stockings. Why did they wear blue stockings, these dashing, they, daring men? I think they were, were cheaper and more comfortable uh, and they also denoted that these were not courtly gatherings and I think these gatherings were trying to signify their difference from the more courtly ritualistic gatherings that you might have found. Just one more question. It was clearly a trivial thing, the name, but still, why did they pick a name from chaps rather than have a name of their own? I'm not absolutely sure about that. It was actually a word uh, that was used pejoratively about Cromwell's bare bones parliament in the mid-17th century, which is even (laughs) worse. But uh, as you said, initially the term was not pejorative, it just became so later in the 19th and 20th centuries. So we have these aristocratic Mm. women at different... Right, away you go. Sorry, interrupted. Uh, Well, I was was going to say, I mean, I think... So partly this is about a, a social gathering, a kind of social... An English version of the French social salon, but also more broadly... Uh, This was a network uh, of intellectuals who fostered female scholarship, women publishing, creative endeavour through their friendships, through their patronage and through their letter writing. And they were very, very voluminous letter writers. And they were extraordinarily successful in achieving cultural visibility for women writers in the 18th century. We're getting ahead of ourselves, Karen, so just let's stop there. What, what, What precedent was there? Was there any precedent for these sort of gatherings of women? There were. There I mean, obviously were. women had got together to talk, but any this is much more formal, it's much more public, it's yes. more we are doing this and we are being seen to be doing it. Was there anything like that happened before? There were precedents, and they were principally continental precedents. So in the late 17th century in France, there had been gatherings of this, these kinds, and there were French salons throughout the 18th century. Um, and the more intellectual salons in France were inspired by the philosophy of Descartes, and a group of women scholars um, formed salons around those discussing those kind of philosophical ideas. But I think... I think, nevertheless, there was something new about the idea of the female intellectual in late 17th century and early 18th century Britain. But when we say we meet, they're meeting in very substantial houses, in, in one or two cases, the, among the most substantial houses in London. Are we talking about meeting every week, every fortnight, every month? Roughly monthly, uh, sometimes more frequently, but also the virtual meetings that take place through letter writing and visits and country houses uh, during the summer season. Did they, did they know that they were a, a sort of... I was about to say gang, <laughs> group, really. <laughs> they were a group uh, that had to keep going. Did, did, was it, did they think, oh, we're in for the long haul here, we are doing something that will hold us together and, and have influence elsewhere? Over time, they did develop quite a distinctive group self-consciousness, so yeah. they would refer to themselves as the Blue Stocking Club. So I think it probably started without any deliberate intent. But in terms of the kinds of spaces that they tried to create and their sense of themselves as a group... That was something that coalesced quite definitely and that other people recognised. Was this a late afternoon enterprise? You talked about tea. Uh, I'm not sure, actually. Elizabeth might be able to answer that in terms of the time. Well, of just, no, I'll come in a second. I'm, okay. with, I'm poking away. Just like an image. How many of them? Where did they turn up? Four o'clock in the afternoon? How long did they stay? 
I think it was the late afternoon and numbers varied, but... Sometimes it went on after midnight. <laughs> so it really depended. Um, I think it started as a very intimate gathering, but then, then it became something more public. Um, Nicola Pearl, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Ager has uh, come into the conversation there. Um, I mean, Elizabeth Montague was one of the central figures, the one we know about. Most we know most about her, apart from her eight thousand letters and her essay on Shakespeare and her massive wealth. And she was a, a central uh, a hostess or controller. Could you tell us a bit more about her? Yes, well, she was known as Queen of the Blue Stockings, but like Karen said, um, she didn't really hold court. She created a space for the life of the mind. And I think, going back to what Karen was saying about the meetings, um, they were referred to as the Blue Stocking Club, but also as a lyceum, an academy, a college. And we have to remember that women couldn't go to university at this time. Um, they were expected not to speak. They were to be seen and not heard. Um, to be clever as a woman was very difficult and to display it in a fashionable metropolitan context was very new and she was determined to make her her house um, accessible to, to men and women who were interested in discussing ideas and it was interesting because she brought together people of different politics and different intellectual backgrounds um, particularly as, as her her life progressed. Where did she come from? I mean, how did she get to be the woman covered in diamonds who had these great, this, uh, I was about to say, Suarez meetings? Well, she was born into the gentry and married into the aristocracy, and it was through her great friendship with Margaret Cavendish, the Duchess of Portland, who was the daughter of Edward Harley, whose wonderful collection of books forms the basis of the British Library. And it was through this friendship, um, when she was a very young girl, about 12 or 13, and the earliest letters to the Duchess of Portland are mischievous, witty, subversive and highly entertaining. Um, she makes fun of all the contemporary rituals of courtship, um, the prejudice against women. Um, and she, she, um, she really finds herself through this friendship. And then it's when... Uh, and it's through the Duchess that she meets her husband, Edward Montague, who is much older than her, a tendency towards solitude and uh, mathematics. Um, and he has coal mines in New Newcastle, and um, she takes charge of his business, really, and makes a lot of money. And I think it's a very important point, because, as Karen said, she bans the aristocratic sins of gambling and um, drinking, but she's, she's very careful with her money. Um, she never goes into debt in her lifetime. Um, by the end of her life, the coal, um, Montague, Maine, is the best-selling coal on the market, and she has one of the largest bank accounts for an individual at Hoare & Co. in Fleet Street, and you can go and look at the archives now, and it's, it's fascinating to see how carefully she manages her money. <laughs> It's, just, it's an extraordinary social uh, rocket, isn't it? She's 12 or 13, she starts writing letters to an uh, extremely powerful eminent. Then he's taken up by her, that's what happened, isn't it? Because there's the Duchess of 20 years old, she's 13, mm -hmm. uh, and then introduced to the Earl of Sandwich, or the grandson of the Earl of Sandwich, sorry, who, as you say, solitary mathematician and much older than she is, uh, marries... <laughs> Do you have anything else to say about it? Is it I mean, suge I'm suggesting, quite wrongly, obviously, that there was some calculation involved. Definitely. She was very um, determined and ambitious, um, which are qualities which don't are you know always remarked upon if it's a woman, I think. And if she, was, if she had been the man of her day, this, this would not have really been so remarkable. Um, she was very proud of the number of roles she played. Um, she wrote in... in um, in a letter to her sister, Sarah Scott, I am a critic, a co-loner, a land steward, a sociable creature. And I think she enjoyed enabling people to do, to do things. She was at the heart of a network. Um, and she was interested in social progress, really. Um, so she, she was seen to be a snob by some people and she was quite manipulative at times. Um, but it's interesting when you think back to her youth, there was some sense in which she was perhaps expected to be a lady's companion to the Duchess of Cavendish, but it was through her intellectual brilliance that Margaret Cavendish accepted her as an equal. And so she rose through through the power of her wit, and I think she always remembered that. Do you... Uh, we, we speak about many, many letters, and you start the one witty ones when she was 13, about 8,000 letters. So was there a letter that says, I am going to form this sort of group, I want this to happen? Or um, a few letters, I mean, none of you. I don't think so, because I think it was... Uh, it evolved naturally um, f from the social context in a way. Um, I think later in the in the group, 
um, I mean, women are inevitably aware of... Um, I mean, Hannah Moore put it, they're constantly having their sex taken into account. I think they were self-conscious of being seen as a group by other people. Um, but I don't think they necessarily planned it. It, it happened. And, and it is fascinating that the word blue stocking, as you say, we could compare it to other wor words used of learned societies like dilettante, virtuoso. Um, it's a very specific English word and it's only it was very fashionable at first actually and it only becomes derogatory when it's associated purely with women which is interesting in terms of the history of the prejudice against women yeah um, Nicola Pearl what, can we just be a bit more specific mm -hmm. now what were the what do you see the aims of the blue stockings and what would happen in a typical meeting because there were several houses but let's take there, there were Elizabeth. several houses yeah so we, if you start off with the with the aims if you want to Elizabeth Montague kind of nicely summarizes this in what she calls the blue stocking doctrine um, so you can see that eventually they developed the kind of concept behind this and the doctrine was rational conversation now rational conversation in the 18th century is a term that needs to be unpacked a bit because it refers back to the classical period it refers back to the renaissance in terms of conversation in a way that's what we're doing here interestingly so um Rational conversation in the 18th century refers back to this idea of as conversationis in the Renaissance, also the classical um, philosophical debate, but debates that were not only intellectual but led to moral improvement. So there was a sense of that if you exchanged conversations with other people, you improved each other as well. So there's a kind of social aspect to the conversation. Um, rational conversation, as appropriated by the blue stockings, and meant that they bridged the kind of public and private in many ways because they brought the public into the private homes. We could talk about the homes in a minute. It also meant intellectual and moral improvement. So um, Elizabeth Vesey talks about we are the guardians of virtue and we are the instructors of our minds. But virtue in the sense meant civic virtue, right? So it's a political, um, there's a political element in it. Um, if you think about all the pamphlets that were written in the 18th century about rational conversation, we have someone like Fielding, The Art of Conversation, and he talk, goes back to this idea of the on it om, where, you know, the chivalrous idea of conversation, where you say, okay, um, in a conversation, an on it om will strive for truth, but also be charitable, benevolent. And, and share something. He also says something, I've always said, that if, if somebody mm. speaks about something they know a great deal about, but they know nobody else knows much about all the time, it's extremely bad manners and bad yes, conversation. Yes, exactly, yeah. exactly. We come across that, don't we? <laughs> But also, in a way, that's a really good point, because, of course, if you look at conduct books in the 18th century, it always, always stipulates, they always, always stipulate that women must not show off intellectually at all. So Men the could, you mean? Pardon? Men could. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no problem with that. But women, if precisely they knew a bit more than men, they would hold back, right? So the blue stocking said, well, nonsense with that. We are going to appropriate the idea of rational conversation. We can be rational as women. Can I just ask you, you, you said you'd unpack this notion, Nicole. Can you just define, was there a, a set, almost like a formal conversational dance about this rational conversation did she say we start at point a this is the proposition what's the opposition to it what's your view of that is right. it was it was it as formal as that no it wasn't right. you mean like platonic dialogue yeah. now what you're referring much more to is the french precedent you All will right. find that in the french salons um, often the themes were prescribed or certainly there were themes that were not allowed to be spoken about. Um, the blue stocking assemblies, and we come to the point now about what happened in the evenings, was much more loose. But what was really important is to look at what the changes were that the blue stockings brought in. Now, if you look at contemporary accounts of evening um, assemblies or evening dues, dinner parties um, in the aristocracy or the middling classes, at the end of the meal, the women went to one corner and the men to the other. The men talked about, as Elizabeth said, Elizabeth Carter said, you know, about the old English poets. And the women were tittle-tattling and doing their embroidery or something. And this is what the blue stockings were against. They wanted to bring the men and women together and all talk about literature, all talk about politics, all talk about philosophy, 
in an unstructured way, in a way, but what was excluded was the, as Karen said, the drinking, the card playing, the gossip. It was there to improve intellectually. Karen, Karen O'Brien, back to you. The, the, um, uh, Nichols alluded to Elizabeth Vasey and the, another Elizabeth, Elizabeth Carter. Can you just briefly tell us a little about, about those two other Elizabeths? Elizabeth Carter was the leading scholar of the group. She was a phenomenal scholar of Latin, Greek, Arabic, Hebrew and numerous educated other languages. Educated by whom? When? She was more or less self-educated at home. She was the daughter of a clergyman. She had good access to books when she was growing up, but she, she forced herself by staying awake half the night to really learn these languages. Uh, and when she was quite a young woman, she made a name for herself as a poet. She came to know Samuel Johnson. She wrote a little bit for one of his periodicals. But her major project was to translate the Stoic Greek philosophy of Epictetus. His works had never been translated in their entirety, and she embarked on this huge translation of all of his works, which she published with an introduction and with notes, and it, it sold exceptionally well. So she is one of the blue stockings who made her mark as a scholar, publishing uh, and really claiming to be a first in this kind of endeavour. Elizabeth Vasey was another, um, I'm not, I hesitate to use the word hostess, gatherer of a group she together. Was, yes. And she was rather different from Elizabeth She was Montague. somewhat different, yes. and I think probably self -conscious, consciously differentiated her salon from that of Elizabeth Montagu. So she was another London society hostess. Um, but she almost obsessively tried to make her gatherings even more informal than those of Elizabeth Montague. So Montague's gatherings uh, consisted often of a kind of arc of chairs where Montague would sit at one end of the room and the conversation would kind of cascade down the room in a somewhat structured manner, a rational conversation, as Nicole said, whereas Vasey would deliberately scatter her chairs all around the room ahead of the salon to try and create these subsets of rational conversations and this spark of ideas during her salons. Elizabeth, Elizabeth, can I come to you again? We've talked, we've alluded to literature. His civic virtue has been mentioned uh, by Nicole. Can you tell us about, not necessarily naming them, if you do, you do, uh, what other areas they went into? They represented. What did they bring to the table, if there was a table, these uh, the different women who turned up? There'd be about, what, 20 turning up, that sometimes 15. Many, sometimes, sometimes many more. I mean, sometimes many more. Sometimes many more. Um, I mean, I think um, they wanted to create um, interaction between different different kinds of art and and music and and so on. But but I think also it's important to see their emphasis on conversation in terms of um, commercial culture and the energy of of the Enlightenment. And um, it's very difficult to know what they said because the re it, it, conversation is notoriously now we have podcasts on on the website of of, of in our time, but. We only can hear 18th century conversation in, in quite formal representations of it. But there is a wonderful poem by Hannah Moore, who is one of the second-generation figures who came to Montague's Salon. And she writes a wonderful poem um, called, called Conversation. And I think it really epitomises this connection. You have it in your hand? Yes, just a, a short extract. Yes, it's, um, Well, it's a very forceful um, and, and concise definition. Our intellectual awe must shine, not slumber idly in the mine. Let education's moral mint the noblest images imprint. Let taste her curious touchstone hold. To try of standard be the gold, but tis thy commerce conversation must give it use by circulation. That noblest commerce of mankind, whose precious merchandise is mind. And I think that's an extraordinary bringing together of all sorts of historical transformations of the 18th century. And... Um, it's precisely because of that commercial energy. I mean, Montague's home is a great... She's a great patron of um, um, new techniques in, in interior decoration. So she's people praise her use of ormolu or um, her wonderful interior paintings um, and her own feather screens at the end of her life were an extraordinary sight in London. Um, Angelica Kaufman um, worked on one of her interiors in Portman Square... Um, it, it's about being modern and fashionable, and but also somehow being morally virtuous at the same time. Um, it's, I think that's very um, difficult for for contemporary people to understand because um, conspicuous consumption on that level doesn't go with intellectual. Um, no, it does seem, doesn't it, really, um, that the, the he, masses of money coming out of the coal mines of Northumbria. A lot of it landing around the neck of Elizabeth Montague in the form of her addiction to diamonds and this building of this new house. But, but that's 
almost to one side if she's driving through this what I suppose a lot of listeners would be associating in their minds now, so it's worth turning to, is a salon. We know of it in the terms of the French salon. And there was a relationship, Nicole, but will you tell us more about it? The relationship was um, quite interesting and complicated in many ways. So uh, contemporaries like Roxol called um, Elizabeth Montagu the Madame du Défant of the English capital, so making ad- um, immediate references to 18th century uh, French salonnières. And Elizabeth Montagu was very aware of French salons. She went herself in 1776 to Paris to visit Madame Dufon, um, um, Madame Geoffrin, all the kind of famous um, salonnières themselves. Is it worth saying, I'm Sorry. interrupting only to add to it, that she would be very welcome there because of her essay Absolutely. on Shakespeare. exactly. Which I just made, which just been made. But she she wrote an network. essay on Shakespeare, Attacking Voltaire. Yeah. Well, can you take that? Because Attacking Voltaire was the key to her popularity. It was Attacking Voltaire and yeah. engaging with him. And actually it was about um, re-establishing Shakespeare's reputation in the 18th century as a main English playwright. So this was the project. But she did it said she did it said only a woman could do this where she yes. wrote, that's the inter- could you say a bit more about that because it's fascinating i think elizabeth probably knows more about the essay on shakespeare but it was precisely that she took on board and saying only a woman can do this and i have enough intellectual strength and knowledge to defend Shakespeare against such a great thinker as Voltaire. And she became quite infamous because of this this essay, which was very well received. I mean, um, Shakespeare's position in the 18th century was slightly sort of underrated, if we think about it. I mean, people ended, um, changed Shakespeare's endings, um, only Garrick in the end, um, because of Elizabeth Montague and a couple of other writers, picked up on Shakespeare again as his main English writer. So her Montague's reputation as um, a um, essayist, if you want to, and as a salon lady, as well as a um, um, lady of society, of polite society, preceded Elizabeth Montagu when she went to Paris. And, of course, she herself received um, loads of French writers and thinkers herself, so she received in England the Neckers, she received the um, diplomat Mazzarini, the Duc du Nivernais. She knew loads of important people, so she, when she went to Paris herself in seventy six, she went there to look for the salons of Louis XIV. Did she find something? Did, what did she copy from them? I mean, Right. I don't think she copied anything right. from them, which is really important. The French salons were slightly more formal. Um, they were devised, as I mentioned earlier, by themes much more. You had someone like the Madame de Scruderie in the 17th century who had her summer days, so every Saturday they meant. You had Madame de Defon who said, well, these are the people I will invite. Madame Geoffrin said on Tuesdays I invite these people, on Wednesdays these people. The blue stockings didn't do that at all. Elizabeth Montague was incredibly impressed by the politeness and the style of the um, 18th century French salons. However, she made a political comparison between France and England in the 18th century. She took England and English liberty and English rationalism as a yardstick against the French and said, actually, what we have in England is much more important. We have rationalism and proper rational conversation. Which takes us, thank you very much, which takes us, Karen O'Brien, I think, to the Blue Stockings connection with the some thinkers of the Scottish Enlightenment. Yes, Can they were... Can you talk about that connection? Yes, they were very, very interested, obviously, in the French Enlightenment, but also uh, in the Scottish Enlightenment, the home of the most advanced economic and social thinking of the day. Montague herself visited Edinburgh and she made friends with a number of lead thinkers. And I think elaborating but on this idea... she made friends with... She always made friends with the, the leading thinkers, didn't you? Not, I mean, yes, she did. She Hume made friends with Lord Kames, with yeah. James Beattie and with a number of thinkers and read a great many more. I think if we're thinking about this idea of rational conversation, it's very interesting in this context because the Scottish Enlightenment thinkers wrote about and thought about the extent to which a mixed gender public sphere, a more visible role for women and the role of sociability in modern society defined Britain as an advanced civilization. So I think she used some of those ideas to think through what it might mean to have women in a prominent public role in British cultural life. 
I think the second thing to say is the Scottish Enlightenment was also home of some of the very advanced literary criticism of its day. Keynes himself wrote uh, an elements of criticism, a a literary critical primer, and he incorporated into that work some of Elizabeth Montague's letters. So uh, she wrote him a very long letter, and he quite simply lifted it and incorporated. So there was a sense of collaboration between the blue stockings. stealing, not collaboration. Uh, Well, well, it was with her tacit permission, but there was a sense of collaboration between her and the Scottish Enlightenment. And Hume, the, the, the ideas of Hume were very uh, were brought into this group. They, they were very well aware of the ideas of Hume. I think an important thing to say, and it's also a difference, I think, between the Blue Stockings and the French, is that they were very suspicious of anything that had a, a, a tinge of religious scepticism. So Hume was a little bit suspect mm. from that point of view. The French salons were a little bit suspect from that point of view. There was a lot of covert talk about materialism and atheism, and Montague and her friends did not like that kind of thing. Um, can we just, while we're on the view, just come, check a point with you here. Men were, we, we, it was mainly women, but men were admitted to the group. We, oh, yeah. And, Samuel, and again, it's Samuel Johnson turning up, it's Edmund Burke turning up, it's, it's the top men, the, the, top, thinkers, men, the yes. top thinkers that, that she ropes in uh, to these, which is wonderful. I think they're attracted to her, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so it, that's is, it, it? it is a really important point, I think, because actually, if you ask people nowadays, they think blue stockings are all women, but actually, what's overlooked is that they were initially, in the, from the 1750s onwards, there were loads of men. So Bella, Benjamin Stillingfleet, he of the blue stockings, who gave the name to the Blue Stockings, uh, was a botanist and translator and author. We had Samuel Johnson, who you mentioned, but he didn't get on so well with Elizabeth Montague. They ended up in fights. I think we had two big egos next to each other. That didn't work. He preferred to go to Elizabeth Vesey who was much more relaxed about her conversation and, and her structure. And didn't interrupt him. <laughs> yes, that's the other thing, and didn't interrupt him. She just, you know, she was a bit more, shall we say, relaxed about the whole thing. And we have Lord Littleton, of course, who was a correspondent of Elizabeth Montague, but visited the salons as well. And he is really important because we talked about the essay on Shakespeare. We shouldn't forget that she also contributed three sections to Littleton's Dialogues of the Dead. And that's a really important um, document. The Dialogues of the Dead were published in 1760, and Elizabeth Montague was encouraged to contribute anonymously three dialogues to this book. And the Dialogues of the Dead are basically political tracts for the kind of reformation of English society. So we go back to this idea of the civic virtue. This is exactly what the Blue Stockings bought into in many ways. So he was very important. We have Lord Bath who came in, in himself quite a, um, a turbulent and political career. He was a confidant and, and, and friend of Elizabeth Montague. Samuel Johnson we men- mentioned, and then we have Gilbert West, who was himself a poet and translator, but also cousin of Elizabeth Montague. Um, I think from the 1770s onwards, um, and someone like Hester Thrale is, is partially guilty of that, people focused much more on the female aspect of the society of the blue stockings. So in Threliana, for instance, she reflects all on the women together being the blue stockings. Well, but one shouldn't forget that there was that um, mixed sex debate, which was part of expanding the range that I mentioned at the beginning of the sociability of English society. Can I turn to Elizabeth, Elizabeth Edgar again? When you were talking about Shakespeare, Nicole, you pointed across to yes. Elizabeth. <laughs> uh, and we haven't quite nailed it, I think. Uh, the, Voltaire's essay basically said Shakespeare did not follow the classical rules of drama and therefore he was not first rate. I'm using an awful phrase. And he, he, was, he, was, he could be faulted here. And Elizabeth uh, Montague went back and, and attacked him on that basis, saying... Yes. And, and she also said, "Only women can understand women can understand Shakespeare because they're women." So there's two things there. What did she say, and why did she think only women could do it? Well, the first thing is that she was very daring to take on Voltaire head on, and she criticizes him on purely intellectual grounds. She retranslates his mistranslations back into bad English to point out that he doesn't understand the language, which is a very That's um, quite a it's quite it's quite a, <laughs> It's quite a provocative thing to do. And um, I think she could do it in a way that Samuel Johnson probably wouldn't dare to. Um, But the other argument that women understand Shakespeare is very important, I think, because it's quite strategic on one level. 
women um, don't have usually have an um, education in the classics. Um, they they are they express themselves in the vernacular language. And at the beginning of the 18th century, this is still a very live debate, the tension between ancient and modern literature. Um, these women are at the forefront, um, you know, the cutting edge of, 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 of not only contributing to um, the idea of a national literature, uh, um, which is, um, I mean, that you asked them what other, other contributions women's made. There's a wonderful editor of a poet, poetry anthology, Elizabeth Cooper. But who, can we stick to this, this essay in Shakespeare? Sorry. Yes. Well, Sorry we, oh, no, right. absolutely. It's good to stick to so it. So she says... Um, uh, right, can you just go on? Yes, well, I think one fascinating thing is when she, she... She she publishes it anonymously, but it soon becomes very popular, and then she owns it and puts her name to it, which was a quite common practice in the 18th century. But when she goes to France, she's invited to the Académie Française to defend herself or to defend Shakespeare in public. And she says... Um, she refuses to speak because she says it's beneath her dignity because she knows that in the same institution they were debating the value of Homer 20 years ago. Homer, the great poet of the oral tradition. And I think given that the institution didn't formally incorporate a woman into their... Um, they didn't, a woman member of the French Academy doesn't exist until 1980. Mm. And I think it's important to say that because... In England, these women, they do inhabit the central cultural institutions of their time, and yet they never le nevertheless, they feel excluded. And I think it's fascinating to think historically about people who both want to belong but don't belong. She, I mean, I think it's a fascinating essay. We have to move on now, but one thing she says is that, look, we, 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 we weren't formally educated in Latin and Greek, neither was Shakespeare. Mm. So that gives us uh, a more understanding, yes, uh, yeah. more understanding of the way he had to tackle this. And also, we don't believe in your rules. Yeah. We believe in, in yeah. things going waywardly and by indirections, as it were. We have to move on. Sorry. And let, I know that we yes. could spend all morning, but we haven't got all morning. <laughs> uh, can we um, turn now, um, Karen, to the, 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 the view, their views on religion? Yes, this was quite strongly an Anglican movement. A number of the blue stockings were very closely tied to archbishops of Canterbury and leading Anglican theologians of their day. So it's important to see the idea of rational conversation of virtue, partly in a civic context, but also in a religious context. And they think very deeply, a number of them, about the ways in which having religious faith and being involved in a church is a kind of social activism. So how does it inspire philanthropy? How do you balance the claims of your conscience and what you owe to yourself? as a rational creature uh, and what you owe to society. So I think it's important to see this as a kind of social Anglicanism. In the second generation, Hannah Moore, who wrote that conversation poem that Elizabeth quoted, uh, moved into the evangelical wing of the church, opened a number of Sunday schools in Somerset, was very instrumental in a, in a, a school movement for poorer children. So it has quite a significant uh, evangelical uh, 19th century legacy in terms of religiously motivated educational projects and philanthropy. But there were stern supporters of the Anglican ascendancy, really. They were, and they were, they were deeply implicated in, in terms of family, in terms of social uh, and personal ties in that ascendancy. And they didn't want it exaggerated at the one end, and of course they didn't want it opposed at the other end. They didn't want it, most of them wouldn't have liked it too radical or too <laughs> evangelical at one, one end, and they certainly didn't want it too dissenting at the yes. other. Yes. Um, they, they began to, you talk about the second generation. Um, so we, yeah, well, can we just... Turn to you again, Elizabeth. Fanny Burney, the novelist, was part of what's called the second generation. Um, so the first generation, I say 15, I say 1750 to 65 or 17, un until about 75 or 80, another group, big group, come in, painters. Um, what does Fanny Burney tell us about the group? Because she wrote a lot and she had, stern, she had strong views. What does she say that's interesting about the blue stockings? Um, well, her diaries are fascinating accounts of the meetings, and she's very much being presented to them as a young um, prote protege, a, a, a young, an emerging talent. Um, uh, she um, she's uh, very double-edged because she owes a lot to these women, and in a way, she's associated with them because. Um, uh, she, her ability is celebrating the context of, of, of the Blue Stocking Salon. And yet she's quite satirical as well. And um, she wrote a play um, that was uh, never performed in her lifetime called The Whitlings, um, in which she satirises Elizabeth Montagu as Lady Smatter. And her father... Lady Smatter? Yes. That's good word. Um, yeah. And um, I think she was... Um, she... 
many creative women experience great ambivalence in terms of the way in which they're singled out as women. And she, um, she apparently burnt all her writings at the age of 15 because she wasn't sure that she could could cope with the implications of, of her intellectual energies. Um, and I think it's worth remembering that several women of this period, Sarah Scott, the sister of Elizabeth Montagu, Jane Austen indeed, um, left strict instructions for many of their writings to be burnt at the point of death. Um, so I think what's fascinating about Bernie is that she she acknowledges in some of her writings, in some of her accounts of the Blue Stockings, the uncomfortable, competitive and... Um, well, particularly the, the, the acid and savage nature of competition between women and between the sexes. Nicole, um, can we take that as a cue to uh, discussing the decline in the 1790s, mm. which the blue stockings certainly had? Uh, can you take on uh, from that what you thought were the main causes, other causes? Of sure, the of course. And again, um, actually, I would come back to the um, play The Whittlings because Hester Thrale suggested not to perform the play. Hester Thrale was a friend of Samuel yes, Johnson. Yes, exactly, so, yeah. and, and, and kind of looked after him. Yeah. And she recommended not to have The Whittlings performed because it would offend the blue stockings. Um, and you can see that actually earlier, even not necessarily in the 1790s, but from the 1780s, when um, the blue stocking circles was sort of feminized, as in people only focused now on the female members of the blue stockings, you find increasingly a kind of satirical stance and a pejorative stance towards the blue stockings, which has to do in that time, I think, with the increasing um, literacy, but also the increasing literary market for women, so as writers, as authors. So why did the increasing literary market turn people against them? Because there were competition to the men, of course, and later okay. in the Romantic period you have that much more outspoken, and I've got some nice phrases there, sort of by, by Coleridge and Hazlitt, who were very kind of vicious against the blue stockings much later. So we have that, that um, men found that there was a kind of competition in the literary marketplace, from 1789 onwards, the idea of female learnedness was related to the French Revolution, to radical politics, to people like Olympe de Gouges, of course, who wrote their pamphlets and her own kind of declaration of for the um, human rights. And you have suddenly um, terms like Gallic frenzy, and, thrown and also the non-support group. of the radical women in yes, France. Yes, of course. Emphatic uh, non-support, of the, in one case, of fishwives. Right? The, the, the fishwives, yes, yes yeah. exactly. So suddenly words like the fishwives and Gallic frenzy were used to describe the blue stockings. It's quite interesting because the blue stockings themselves were not politically terribly radical. I mean, Sarah Scott, the sister of Elizabeth Montague, writes in a letter to her sister about those fishwives and how outrageous they were. So um, the the 1790s, the kind of anti, anti-French and anti-radical, um, political radical movement, churned people against the blue stockings. And towards the turn of the century and the Romantic period, you will find that this becomes more and more... Um, Prevalent in yeah, it's public culture. disappointing. Culture. Byron, Coleridge. Oh, they were Hazlitt, vicious. They were absolutely them. Yes. vicious. I mean, I know we've got. I've got. I know. I know lots of quotes. You put them up on whatever you, you, <laughs> things you put things up on. We just. Um, just but put, if I could just add that yeah. it was not only against the blue stockings; it was against the learned women themselves. So Hazlitt ma- made it very clear: is that he doesn't want to know. He doesn't give a fig. He says about women who know what an author is. Yeah. He made that very clear. So it yeah, was it's learned depressing. women. I like Hazlitt, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> well, really now it seems to unlike him, but it's about learned yeah. women. And, yeah. uh, and authors and authority, yes. because I think what we haven't really said is that the one thing women could own in this age is their literary property, mm. and it was one means of, of, of achieving independence, oh, yeah. financial independence, um, which is very important, and I think there is a link between the history of women's writing and the history of rights. Which Can I take a kind of shortcut with you, Karen, here? We've got Mary Wollstonecraft heaving up in the 1790s, who is... A woman who educates herself in much the same... Anyway, gets, gets an education through the dissenting churches. The churches are moving into mm-hmm. education. Now, the, salon, the salons are followed by... The riches are followed by, by church, by religious people giving women education. She was a radical. The, the, one of the blue stockings called her a hyena in petticoats. She, they were against her and what she stood for. And it's, it's, I would think it's partly of that sort of, of that sort of attitude that the blue stockings began to wither away and really wither through the 19th century. Is there anything in that? 
I think you're right. In some ways, Mary Wollstonecraft was very indebted to the Blue Stockings, to their ideals about education as something that gives you a, a, a mental reservoir, but at the same time allows you to take on certain kinds of social responsibility. But clearly, she pushed that in the direction of a very vigorous argument for women's civil and religious rights and political rights. Um, so I wouldn't want to overly polarise them. At the same time, people like Mary Wollstonecraft made the wider public nervous and suspicious of radical female intellectuals. At the same time, uh, as Elizabeth and Nicole have indicated, the intellectual female novel continues to flourish in the early 19th century right the way through to George Eliot. So we have Sarah Scott, the sister of Elizabeth Montague, writing a really interesting set of novels in the mid-18th century. And we have, all the way through the 19th century, novelists like George Eliot who create blue-stocking characters like Dorothea, Brooks, uh, Dorothea Brooke uh, who continue to embody that idea of rational conversation and the educated woman. And that's, that's, that is a, a paradox that goes on. But why mm. does the name become pejorative, the name Blue Stock. I think it actually has already become pejorative in the 17th century. It was 17th. used, yeah, it was used as bas bleu in France against the Précieuse, and Molière makes fun of the We've bas bleu as well. We've got to stick to us well. now. I know. The 18th century. <laughs> We're talking about the 18th century. But the, the, it, what I'm in the saying 19th century, it became a pejorative word. It became it? a pejorative word because it was about the the learned woman, the manly wo woman, so to say, the unsexed you know, females yeah. who were intellectual women who were a threat to men. And and I think it resurfaces when you get the first generation of women going to university in the yeah. late 19th century yeah. and you see it again. I mean, blue stocking becomes a term to describe someone dowdy, not someone yeah. fashionable. And I think it's, it's, it's what's fascinating is that it, it, it's an insult because it's women have been pushed out of, of these opportunities and it's um, it's a means of excluding them, it's misogynistic and we shouldn't forget that because mm. you know the fact is the Royal Academy of Arts Angelica Kaufman's a founding member the next time historically that they accept a female member is 1922 if you think of that in relation to suffrage, the vote um, you know I think what the history of blue stockings tells us is that the history of feminism is not a simple tale We're of progress the surface, and I'm going to be biffed if I don't finish now, thank you very much <laughs> Elizabeth Egger, uh, Karen O'Brien, Nicole Pohl and next week we'll be talking about Robert Boyle thank you for listening and the In Our Time podcast gets some extra time now with a few minutes of bonus material from Melvin and his guests. An awful lot of good stuff was said. I mean, I, what do you think? You're going to tell me what you didn't say, OK? But what you did say, <laughs> I think, was cover the field quite well. I think so. The one thing this... I felt sorry we didn't talk about was friendship. Yes. Because I think that um, it's very moving when you read Blue Stocking Letters. They're often very intimate. And I think that's something that, you know, Wollstonecraft placed great value on friendship as well, uh, as, a, as something that was almost utopian in... Because it was different from love or sexual love. That, you know, sexual love is... is um, unreliable and, and fickle and, and um, dangerous, whereas friendship was something that you could commit to and that it was morally... That's a recurring um, theme over two or three thousand years, isn't yes. it? Yes, really? and it was... Yeah, the friendship being, in a way, superior to mm -hmm. love, But is that classical, love. that Ciceronian idea of friendship and mm -hmm. how might you apply it to female friendships and take them more seriously? I think that's... Because in the, in the 18th century, people underestimated female friendship going back to gossip and tittle-tattle, actually this idea that you had friendship in a rational way as well, that that's what the blue stockings mm -hmm. took on, and we didn't get the chance to talk about the letters either because the letters are mm. really mm -hmm. interesting because of the, their kind of documents about, as Lizzie said, about friendship, but about politics, how Elizabeth Montague was not really involved in the court circles but was very political. Mm. Very expressive. Was she political. excluded from the court circle? Well, not excluded, but was yeah. she not up to snuff? I think she opted out. She I think her dad out. would yeah. be her happy decision. if she yeah. went and, like yeah. as Fanny Burney did, spent all her time standing around mm. listening to concerts at the court of George III. It was notoriously deadening and ghastly. Mm. Actually, the madness of George III, that film, mm. captures really well the sheer boredom of yeah. being a sort of lady in waiting to mm. the Queen and standing. So she, she didn't want to do that, but I think her father yeah. would have been. Yeah delighted if she'd had but that she as a career. herself as a like queen because mm. one of the French visitors said oh this is like a levy at her you know she was the lady of the castle as, as Fanny Burney said and and the she, she was a bit of a queen of the blue stockings in that way um so as if she had her alternative court mm. yeah yeah. It's quite interesting, which Elizabeth Vesey, of down. course, didn't have. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was uneasy, well, not uneasy. I'd like to have explored the relationship between the 
the miners in the northeast yes, and the, and yes, the, and, and the, yeah. the diamonds in the in, yeah, in London. I but, agree. Uh, I mean, too, course, she, hmm? she definitely thought that she. I mean, she was, I guess, by the standards of her day, a kind enough employer. Mm. She she had some. She established some schools, didn't she, for the mm. miners' children? She had some concern for their welfare. But but mining in the 18th century was a seriously mm. brutal and dangerous activity and it's children just, would be sent I mean, what's mines. fascinating is not, it's not to sort of blame her or anything, it's just the way that mindsets change. Sure. It probably didn't occur to her that maybe with a lot of this enormous money she should improve the safety in mines and pay people more because that wasn't what was happening in life the life she saw. I think it did to an extent. It's just that, you know, this, the, the benchmark was so low yeah. that it was quite easy to congratulate yourself on doing a little better than everybody else. Right. Well, what she yeah. did is she gave those charity dinners, didn't she, to the miners and, and then she the them. charity dinners to the the um, her farm labourers as well. And I, I read yesterday a letter to James Beatty where she said, oh, I, I gave them all loads of food and gave them sort of an, a little treat in a way, but the the principle was frugality. So I'm not giving them too much um, to make them lazy. I'm just giving them enough just to kind of um, encourage them to work a bit harder for me. So there's there's a double edged sword with charity, isn't there? Well, there is in that case. Yeah. 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 Well, I, I also think. think oh, sorry, I, I also think another interesting thing is that the awareness of the Industrial Revolution. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's slow to dawn on people in London in the later 18th yeah. century what's really happening, and uh, and I would love to know to what extent that was part of the conversation. Did people really understand mm-hmm. industrial transformation in, in the North mm-hmm. and in the Midlands in mm-hmm. London? And was she an agent of that That's understanding? Question, yeah. We honestly don't know. Enter so. Tom Morris stage left yeah. with, with <laughs> offers of riches such as the, that such as were never known. At, uh, at Portman House. For instance, BBC tea or coffee? Oh, coffee would be lovely. Coffee, please. There are many more Radio 4 arts and discussion programmes to download for free. Find these on the website at bbc.co.uk slash radio4.